Hello, welcome back to the Compassion in Therapy Summit. I'm Ravi Chandra, and I'm delighted to be your host for this session. I'm a psychiatrist, writer, and compassion educator in San Francisco, and last year I released a documentary called The Bandaged Place, From AIDS to COVID and Racial Justice. I'm so happy to be here with Dr. Norma Day Vines to explore strategies for broaching the issues of race, ethnicity, and culture. Dr. Norma L. Davines serves as Associate Dean for Diversity and Faculty Development in the School of Education at Johns Hopkins University and maintains a faculty appointment as Professor of Counseling and Educational Studies. Her research agenda addresses multiculturalism as an indispensable tool in the delivery of culturally competent counseling and educational services for individuals from marginalized groups. Dr. Dave Vines specializes in measuring counselors' attitudes about discussing race, ethnicity, and culture within ethnic minority clients. Thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Dave Vines. And I think uh, Nina Simone's song could stand as the theme song for this session. I'm just a soul whose intentions are good. Oh Lord, please don't let me be misunderstood. Um, so your work is so elegantly aimed at creating understanding and allyship through naming and exploring how societal disconnections and power imbalances impact us all. And so to begin with, how do you define broaching and why is it important in the therapeutic context? So I define broaching as the, and I will use the term counselor, uh, but I define broaching as the counselor's effort to explore the contextual dimensions of race, ethnicity, and culture during the counseling process. Uh, many times, um, well, let me just say this, W.E.B. Du Bois said in 1903 that the problem of the 20th century would be the problem of the color line. Here we are ushered into uh, the third decade of the 21st century. We have even more complexities around race and representation, and we still haven't had a conversation about race, ethnicity, and culture. Um, as a counselor educator, this is my 21st fifth year teaching, but as a counselor educator, one of the things I found early on is many of my students uh, struggled to discuss issues related to race, ethnicity, and culture. Clients would come into the counseling session and students could talk about career development. They could talk about grief. They could talk about loss. They could talk about depression. They could talk about anxiety, but they struggled to talk about race. And so I helped develop this model so that students would have a framework and understanding of why this is important and how you do it. Um, I think because societally we don't have um, a template for discussing race and because the counseling session is a microcosm of society in the counseling arena, uh, many students um, don't know how to address these issues. And so my contribution to counseling has been to try to make sense of all of this. So, yeah, so you, you uh, bring up the... Um, the, uh, the the idea that, that this, this, uh, this concept was uh, uh, raised out of your students' experience and how difficult it was to talk about race. So maybe that would be a good place to start. Why was it difficult for students to talk about race in the institutional context? I think it was difficult because, uh, number one, people often don't have permission to talk about race, ethnicity, and culture. Number two, there's a fear of being perceived as racist. I think people uh, are afraid that they will lose control of the session. When people are talking about careers, career development, or grief and loss, or depression and anxiety, people often feel much more comfortable. But talking about race, there's, you know, there's so much vitriol around race that, they're, that, that students often don't know what to say or what to do, and they're afraid that they're going to do the wrong thing. And so there's a lot of anxiety. And because we don't have any models in society, it's hard to bring that into the counseling environment. But one of the things I found is that when students do have, uh, and, and when they do broach, uh, it sort of shifts the whole direction and the tenor of the counseling session, and, and it enhances the therapeutic alliance. All right, so thank you. And what, uh, what have you found in terms of how and why broaching is important uh, from the perspective of the research literature? So um, in our own research, one of the things that we found is that um, ethnic minority counselors typically tend to be more comfortable broaching race, ethnicity, and culture. 
uh, we conducted a recent study where we looked at racial identity functioning and uh, in a sample of school counselor trainees. And one of the things we found out is um, that school counselor uh, trainees, um, and we looked at the relationship between racial identity functioning and virtue. And one of the things we found out is that um, school counselors um, struggled to address issues related to race, ethnicity, and culture when they were operating at the lowest end of the continuum, where they're uncomfortable or refuse to broach. Um, but uh, counselors um, with higher levels of racial identity development were much more comfortable um, and much more inclined to report that they would broach and engage in discussions around race, ethnicity, and culture. Um, one of the things that we also know is the high rates of premature termination among ethnic minority clients. Um, because of the cultural miscommunication that occurs, clients may feel uh, less inclined to discuss issues related to race, ethnicity, and culture. I would also talk about the power imbalance. So the power imbalance between the counselor and the client uh, uh, occurs. And if the counselor doesn't readily invite the client to talk about aspects of their identity or their multiple identities or their intersectional identities, clients may feel that they don't have permission to have these discussions. And so that can be a problem as well. Yes, it's so important to be heard, understood, and validated, particularly in our vulnerable or marginalized identities. So I, I think this is a great model. And one thing which you mentioned in, this, uh, in, the, uh, in the paper that I read uh, was that not discussing uh, was felt as a microaggression. Um, so maybe you could talk about that a little bit. So um, studies, um, I think the study you're referring to is a study that looked at over 2,000 clients and 80% um, uh, of them exper reported experiencing a microaggression within the counseling environment. And so um, basically what that means is that clients are likely going to shut down and uh, the other thing, they, they talked about all of the things we typically associate with microaggressions, but one of the things that resonated with my research team was that not discussing race, ethnicity, and culture was construed by the researcher as a microaggression. So uh, because many people have been conditioned that, you know, in polite company, we don't talk about race and they bring that same attitude in the counseling session. Um, if a client feels the urge or the need, or if there's some, if there's certain identities that are central to who they are and they can't talk about it. Um, they're really just masquerading. Um, their needs are not going to get met and they may not feel that counseling is relevant. They may not feel inclined to return. And hence we see the high rates of premature termination. The other thing, it's incumbent, I believe it's incumbent upon the counselor to discuss issues related to race, ethnicity, and culture, because the counselor wields the balance of power in the counseling relationship. So without that invitation, a client may feel like it may, you know, this discussion may be off limits. Um, if I bring this up, then the counselor may blame me for my problems. They may not look at my problems from a systemic point of view, or, um, but there are many opportunities for things to go awry if the, uh, if the counselor uh, doesn't make that invitation. And I, when I'm training my students, I also say that if a client doesn't need to talk about race, if you invite them to talk about issues related to race, ethnicity, and culture, and it's not germane to their counseling concerns, don't worry about that. That's diagnostic information. You now know that it's not relevant. But one of the things that I've observed over the last, say, 25 years of, observe, of reviewing counseling tapes uh, is that when um, race, ethnicity, and culture are important, and initially or early on in the session, the client says, oh, I don't need to talk about it. Frequently, they navigate back to uh, those concerns of race, ethnicity, and culture, and it, it is centered in some way. Um, so the client may not talk about it initially, but just inviting them lets them know that it's okay, and they may bring it up when it's more relevant or when the therapeutic alliance is stronger and they feel safer. Indeed. Certainly, of course, um, the, the therapeutic relationship is central. Uh, to therapeutic outcomes and maintaining and strengthening uh, the alliance uh, is so important. And, and one thing I, I certainly remember uh, uh, about uh, working with Asian American clients, for example, uh, of course, language and cultural matches are so important. I think this is another way of uh, trying to um, uh, trying to match the person and, and uh, uh, culturally and uh, uh, and speak that language of uh, power, uh, which. Uh, 
which uh, sometimes uh, goes uh, hidden. Um, so broaching uh, particularly issues of power, as that article uh, stated, I, I thought was so was so important. Um, so, so maybe you could uh, describe um, uh, first the levels of uh, uh, of uh, engagement uh, with uh, with this. Uh, I, I believe you had four levels of uh, uh, the spectrum. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. yes. So there are, there are, there are two models: the continuum of broaching behavior, and in the continuum of broaching behavior, um, we uh, sort of theorized about it. Then we developed, um, uh, and part of that framework was an empirically supported conceptual framework of broaching. Then we operationalized it with an instrument. And our findings demonstrated that there were four categories along the continuum. The avoidant counselor refuses to discuss issues related to race, ethnicity, and culture. You know, they think it's unimportant, immaterial. Uh, if a client brings things up around race, ethnicity, and culture, they may redirect the client's attention. But it, it communicates that discussing race, ethnicity, and culture is uh, not permissible here. Uh, the next category on the uh, continuum is the uh, continuing incongruence category. And in that category, the counselor wants to broach, has a desire to broach, but they do it awkwardly, ineffectively, mechanically. So their heart is in the right place, but they don't necessarily have all the tools to broach. The third category is the integrated congruent category. And in the integrated congruent category, the counselor broaches really effectively. So they are able to help the client um, sort of process their concerns around race, ethnicity, and culture. They um, help the client um, make interpretations that are you know, sort of relevant to their experience. They do not blame the client for, um, uh, for issues that happen to them or experiences that they have, but there's a meaningful and substantive dialogue around the relationship between their presenting concerns and how race, ethnicity, and culture sort of influence that. Um, at the final category of the continuum, um, we have the infusion category, and that's um, the counselor is able to do everything the integrated congruent counselor does, but if they're oriented more towards social justice. So these are things that might happen outside the counseling session where you intervene on the not just a single client's behalf, but on multiple clients' behalf to um, address, um, to, to eliminate barriers, to facilitate social change. Um, and to uh, sort of move the client along, move the client along, and recognizing um, that issues related to racism, discrimination, and other barriers may be impacting their path. So that was the first part of the model. Um, when I would do workshops following the first part of the model, people thought that um, the only thing that needed to be broached was uh, differences between the counsel and client, and I certainly think that's important. Um, and the other thing they thought needed to be broached uh, was um, racism and discrimination. And while I believe most people from marginalized groups will tell you that they've experienced um, a fair amount of racism and discrimination, it doesn't define who they are. It's a part of who, of who they are. There's so many other aspects of, of people's identities and people's experience, experiences. So then the next thing that I did is I developed a framework that um, I um, refer to as a multidimensional model of broaching behavior. And with the multidimensional model of broaching behavior, there are four categories. The first one is intra-counseling dimensions. And um, in the intra-counseling dimensions, one of the things we're doing is inviting the client to explore issues related to race, ethnicity, and culture. So we, we might say, we're from different cultures. I wonder how you feel. When I'm, when I'm doing role plays with my students, I say things like, I wonder how you feel about working with a middle-aged African-American woman. Because that would be important to know. You know, if I'm working with a 20-year-old student, they may have seen the young, you know, the young, um, the young counselor, the young, the young therapist down the hall, and they're like, oh, I don't want an old black lady working with me. I want a young person working with me. So that would be something that we need to explore. In one of our articles, we talked, we had a, um, a case study where an older black woman was working with a young gay black man, and, and he was concerned that she might have um, sort of religious objections to working with him because of his sexuality. So they talked about that, you know, that though you've had um, sort of problematic encounters in the past, I want you to know that I'm fully open to your experience. I'm fully open to you being present. Also, if there's ever a point at which you don't feel that um, I am meeting your needs or that I don't get it, I want you to fill the gaps in. That's a way of reducing the power imbalance. So the 
client feels like they can disagree, like they can say, you know, I think you misunderstood me. This is what I meant. Um, but again, we don't want the counselor to wield so much power that the, uh, the client feels like they can't be authentic, show up authentically. Um, the other part of the intercounseling dimension is just to invite the client to let them know it's okay to talk about race, ethnicity, and culture. Because one of the things I think we know as people from marginalized groups is that we have few opportunities to um, really show up as our authentic racial, ethnic, cultural selves. People only want to hear it in a limited way. Um, so that's the intra-counseling dimension. The next um, dimension uh, that uh, I think is really important is intra-individual. An intra-individual dimension has to do with um, intersectionality. Yes, I am African-American, but I, you cannot reduce me to just being African-American. There are multiple identities that I have. And we, this is the opportunity to talk about the extent to which um, issues around race, gender, uh, social class, sexual orientation, um, uh, religion, all of these identity dimensions that sort of shape your presenting uh, problem and sort of show you in all your complexity. So that's what the intra individual di um, dimension focuses on. Then there's the intra counseling, I mean, intra uh, racial ethnic cultural dimensions. And that's where we look at um, within group kinds of tensions. So many people think that um, uh, people from minoritized groups are one indistinct group that, that were homogenous. Uh, but that is not the case. There, you know, there are many ways of being anything that we show up as. And some of the within group differences um, can create tensions, conflicts, and so forth. I will give you um, an example um, that I often use when I'm teaching is uh, Eugene Robinson, who's a um, the, the, one of the associate editors at the Washington Post um, wrote a, a book called Disintegrated, Disintegrated, um, The Splintering of Black America. He wrote it about 10, 12 years ago. Um, and he said that prior to the civil rights movement, African-Americans had a shared political objective, and that was to, um, to feel liberated, to get liberation, to be treated as equal citizens. Um, he said, but following that, um, there you know, groups of African-Americans didn't understand one another very well. So he identified um, tr transcendent Blacks, and those Blacks are people who are so rich and powerful, we know them on a first name basis, Jay-Z and Will, um, I mean, Jay-Z and Beyonce, Will and Jada, Oprah and Stedman. Um, then he talked about a mainstream group of African-Americans, and those are African-Americans that are sort of oriented towards the middle-class dream. Then he identified an abandoned class of African-Americans, and those are African-Americans that are dealing with the attendant consequences of poverty uh, um, and, disenfranch and disenfranchisement. And um, uh, the fourth category he identified were emergent Blacks, and those were continental Africans, Caribbean emigres and uh, biracial individuals. Those are many groups of, and we can even dissect it even further, but we can't assume that all blacks are the same. We can go through every racial, ethnic, cultural group and do the same. But with those differences, there are often tensions that come along with some of the, you know, those differences um, that create a lot of psychological distress for individuals. And we need to be able to talk about that. So, um, you know, there may be differences, social class differences within a single family may make, different family members feel estranged from one another. Um, when we think about immigration statuses that may be different, immigration statuses in families may, you know, invoke power dynamics and, you know, within group times kinds of tensions. And as counselors, we have to allow space for that in the therapeutic arena. And then finally, there was the intercounseling, um, intra interracial, ethnic, and cultural concerns. And that's where we deal with racism and discrimination. And you can see, as I've gone through all of the different categories, we cannot reduce broaching to, um, we're from different cultures, and what kind of racism and discrimination have you experienced? Whew. Well, I feel like I just got a master class in, in just uh, uh, so, so much uh, that's important for our work. Um, and I guess, uh, uh, to just take it all in for a moment, uh, and what I'm thinking of is uh, certainly self-awareness at the key, the, the therapist's self-awareness of who they are, but self-awareness in context, uh, who am I in relation to other people and to society. Um, so, so this is a, a beautiful way to look at it. Um, uh, 
Speaking first of the um, of the uh, the first uh, spectrum that you uh, described, um, uh, and I love the term infusion. By the way, where did that where did that come from? Infusion, as opposed to maybe confusion. <laughs> um, so we were we were. Um... I was working with a group of doc students at the time and we were, you know, sort of theorizing about what this would be like. And that's, you know, what they came up with. They just, and, but it, it sort of spoke to the fact that you are, you know, meeting all marks, you know, um, you are um, really invested in not just the client individually, but you're in, invested in their socio-political reality and how that impacts them on a larger scale beyond the council client dyad. Right. I guess maybe confusion is not the other dyad, but it's rigidity. And infusion feels very flexible and uh, it's in being infused into the water. So being in, in the system and making a uh, making your therapeutic actions uh, uh, very broadly. So, so that's great. So, um, so how can this spectrum uh, help us as individuals gain a, uh, awareness of our current capacity for broaching and help us grow? So one of the things that we've developed is an instrument, the Broaching Attitudes and Behavior Survey, which counselors can take and sort of see where they fall on the continuum. Um, we use it um, not in terms of making decisions about people, but really in terms of understanding um, uh, how we best provide training and supervision for counselors. So if we know where, you know, the the interventions that we may use for a counselor that is avoidant is very different than the interventions we may use for someone that is um, uh, integrated congruence. And so the, that's one way. Okay. And, you know, it, it, really, certainly the infused I, uh, is the ideal um, that I think uh, all therapists should be working towards. And, and can, can you maybe describe that, uh, that, uh, that therapist? What, what is that therapist doing? Yeah. So, so we define the therapist as, um, as this was a way of being. It's not just something that you profess. You don't just have a rhetorical commitment or you say the right words. We're from different cultures. How do you feel about work, working with me? But it's more a, you know, a way of being, a, a way of operating in the world. So you are able to work with the client individually, but also you're able to recognize some challenges that, that clients have. In our, in our first article in 2007, we talked about um, uh, a Latina who was uh, on her way to college and she went to a college in a remote area of the country and she was one of very few. And so the counselor saw her. Um, and so there would be certain interventions you do in the counseling sessions, but for when we talk about social justice in initiatives, advocacy and systemic change, you might start a small group for um, Latino uh, students who may feel a sense of isolation and alienation on the campus. Um, so you're engaged in the work of helping to affect change as opposed to just working in the context of the counselor client dyad. Well, I feel like this could uh, uh, take so much expansion. I, I, I certainly feel like this should be part of our board certification process is to, uh, to assess and encourage people along this pathway. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, may I say yeah, one other sorry, thing? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I have a good friend that um, uh, saw this model. She's not a counselor, and she said, "Norma, this is this is not just a counseling model." And I'm like, "Yes, it is. It's just a counseling model." And um, no, she said, "This is an organizational development model." So we've been uh, presenting it now as an organizational development model. So I think you are limited as a counselor, as a therapist, if you're in an organization that really won't allow you to broach. You know, so if you're in an organization that is oriented more to, on the avoided end of the continuum, your hands may be tied in terms of what you do. But if you're oriented, if your organization is oriented at the infusing level. Um, they may be open to both their strengths and areas for improvement, and they may be open to sort of looking at policies and removing barriers and sort of uh, really focusing on the notion of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Yes, certainly institutions uh, do need a lot of work. Um, so, so yes, this would be a great model, and perhaps we'll return to that. Um, uh, Perhaps you might, uh, you, you shared one brief uh, example, um, but perhaps you, you have another uh, short story or case study that illustrates the importance of bringing this level of precision to our work. 
So, yes, I, I do have a, a story that is also a, a sort of the one of the inspirations for this model. Um, during my first faculty appointment, I was teaching a diversity class. Uh, no, it was not diversity. It was a practicum in counseling class. And, um, you know, each week the students go out and they see clients and um, then you come back and they have individual supervision. So we were going through individual supervision. I had a 25 year old white female counselor who was counseling one of our undergraduate students who was a junior African-American female student. And their sessions were going you know, in a circle, you know, like every week the, it, the sessions weren't going. It was almost painful to watch. And so I finally said, I think you need to ask her what it means to be one of very few um, students of color on this campus. And the next supervision session came, we watched the tape, she didn't say anything. A second supervision session came, uh, you know, we were still going in circles. And so I finally said, if you want to pass my class, you're gonna need to broach with her. And so she did uh, during the next session and the floodgates came open. The students started talking about being the first in her family to go to college. She started talking about feeling a sense of isolation and alienation, not being certain whether this was the college, you know, for her, you know, sort of coming from um, a rural community. And uh, so I didn't really think anything of it. The student did pass my class. I had her again next semester in internship. And what, during class one day, she said, Dr. Devines, can I say something to the class? And I said, sure. And she said, um, you know, last semester, um, I had Dr. Devines for um, practicum and she told me that I needed to broach. And, I, you know, I was really resistant. I didn't broach. And then after I did, one of the things I realized is I was uncomfortable you know, having this conversation. The client was ready, the client was prepared. Um, and so that was just a moment of, of uh, it was an aha moment, a moment of self-awareness for her. The interesting thing, I don't usually tell this part of the story, the student, uh, the undergraduate student uh, graduated and started matriculating in our counseling program. Uh, so, yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. So she had such a good experience in counseling. Um, uh, well, I assume, yeah, and then, and then she uh, moved forward with it. Um, and that, that's so parallel uh, to, to uh, several experiences I, I, I can, uh, I'm thinking of in therapy. Um, uh, and uh, that idea uh, of the therapist, uh, you know, being uncomfortable and uncertain with this territory uh, is certainly so rich. Um, so that's, you know, I think, um, uh, so there's something to be said about uh, going into the uncertainty and the discomfort. Um, and uh, uh, certainly, I think um, uh, these vulnerable identities uh, that we, we share uh, uh, and, and that we ha carry um, need receptivity and collaborativity. So developing our own ears is so important um, and, and our ability. Uh, so this, uh, so broaching um, is really uh, a fantastic model. Um, so uh, just curious. Uh, so, so this uh, this therapist, uh, how did they 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 were uncomfortable, and then did they did they uh, gather greater comfort as they? I think so because and, and she was able to see that you know in the the earlier sessions were stalled and they really weren't making any progress. But once she asked this question, the floodgates came opened, and uh, the, the 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 session took a very productive direction. Um, I had a student a couple years ago um, at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, she was an Asian student who was working with um, an African American student, and um, we were online by that by that point. And she said um, to the student, "How are you doing?" And the student said, "Oh, I'm, oh, I'm blessed and highly favored in the Lord," and you know, just was talking about how well she was doing. But this was at the beginning of the pandemic. And so during supervision, I said to the to the graduate student, I was like, mm, none of us are really okay. You know, <laughs> we're in the middle of a we're in the middle of a pandemic. So and one of the things that we need to do, and I talked about in in um in supervision is understand the language or the vocabularies of distress for clients. And so I said, you know, when you go back to talk to her the next time, um, instead of asking her how she's doing, ask her um, if she's aware of this phenomenon we call strong black woman phenomena or the superwoman super syndrome. Um, 
because I wasn't convinced that the client was uh, okay. And so again, she asked that question and the floodgates came open. The students started talking about everybody sort of dumping on her, her being responsible for, you know, lots of people and lots of things and, you know, feeling an enormous burden. And so again, being able to connect with the client's cultural experience becomes uh, important um, so that we can sort of not only get the client to tell their story, but to facilitate change. One other thing I'd like to say in our recent, a recent article, I think it was last summer, we've developed an article on strategies for broaching. And we came up with four specific strategies. The first strategy was joining. And so we talked about really building the therapeutic alliance so that the counselor, so the client would feel comfortable talking to the, the client. So excuse me, so that the client would feel comfortable talking to the counselor. Um, and then um, joining, joining about, would be, I'm sorry, would be like, uh, uh, I think you mentioned in the paper, uh, small talk, what you described. Small, that, small that talk. Or, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Establishing rapport, the therapeutic relationship, a working alliance. Yes, exactly. And a lot of times I think people make the assumption that you just do that at the beginning, but that's something that needs to be done throughout. People need to feel like you're invested in them. So we talked about the importance of doing it consistently throughout your time with the client. Then we talked about um, uh, sort of assessment. The second phase is or strategy is assessment. And so when we think about assessment, um, what I call it with a go, W-T-H-I-G-O, figure out what the heck is going on with the client. So we want, to, uh, uh, many counselors call it multicultural case conceptualization. So what is going on for the client culturally? You know, um, what, what, what is their culture of origin? What, uh, what is it that they value? What are their historical encounters with this, with, within this country? What are, what is their racial identity development? You know, sort of what are those, um, uh, cultural domains that we really need to understand. And when we talk about broaching, we're talking about paying selective attention to the most salient aspects of the client's cultural experience. So sort of figuring the, you know, those out. Um, figuring out, is the relationship ready for me to broach? You know, so sort of putting your, you know, your, your finger on the thermometer and trying to decide. Um, thinking about, um, um, is the client ready to have the uh, discussion? Um, and then what is your level of efficacy? Do you feel like you are ready as a kid? I mean, so these are all a series of cognitive processes that councils have to go through. You don't just launch into a broaching event. You, um, you sort of conceptualize what's going on. And then we talked about um, the, the third stage, which is preparation. Again, it's still sort of a thought process. Um, where you're preparing, you know, you're thinking about what am I going to broach? How am I going to broach? What is my delivery going to, you know, to be like? So you're organizing what you're going to say. There's a certain amount of intentionality. You're saying this because you expect the client to talk about that. Um, you also think about the source of oppression that the client may be um, uh, dealing with. Uh, so um, are they dealing with racism? Are they dealing with sexism? Are they dealing with homophobia? Are they dealing with classism? You know, what are the, what might the isms be that might warrant discussion? Um, that, that won't be necessary in every case, but you need to be familiar with the, the sources of oppression that the client is uh, encountering. And then the uh, Fourth stage is the delivery stage where you actually make a thoughtful broaching statement. And a lot of people think that you broach and that's it, but you broach and then you integrate broaching with your foundational counseling skills. So you're broaching and then you're using reflection of content, reflection of feeling, responding to what the client is saying. You're using silence. You may ask a couple you know, more questions. You may um, use interpretation or immediacy, but we're integrating broaching with our foundational counseling skills. And um, so, yeah, so th those are the steps because I think people feel like, well, you say broaching, but you know, what does that look like? How do you do it? And so we try to give people some, some guideposts in terms of how to do it. This is beautiful and a beautiful way to kind of uh, review what one is doing or plans to do in therapy. And um, I said earlier um, that this is uh, first starts with self-awareness and self-awareness in context. And I think, um, uh, you know, and then, then that expands to the awareness of the possibility of rupture and disconnection in the treatment alliance because of positionality. And then ultimately, a better understanding of what the world feels like to the, to the, to the client uh, themselves. Um, yeah, one great example that was in the paper uh, was actually uh, uh, two patients who were 
Uh, on the surface, they're both white uh, uh, people, a white male counselor and a white female patient. And uh, the, the white female patient, though, happens to be a uh, lesbian. And, and uh, the counselor actually uh, steps right into it and says, you know, uh, well, maybe you can describe that story. Yes. Uh, so let me, let me tell you, uh, that happened in an actual class uh, during supervision. And I got permission from the students to use their transcript. It was so beautifully done. I was watching the tape and I was like, oh, I don't know where this is going to go. Um, but the, I think the counselor says something about, you know, how do you feel about working with me? And I think he assumed that this, the client was going to say, oh, fine. And she was like, no, I have a lot of issues. I, you know, you're a white man and I've had a lot of issues with white men. I've, you know, I've, I've had a, a, a lot of negative encounters and um, he doesn't get defensive. He, you know, sort of acknowledges that he has a certain amount of privilege. He acknowledges um, that, you know, her struggles and her challenges. And um, he, um, he is compassionate, understanding, and receptive of her concerns in a way that um, helps her reduce some of her, you know, some of her defenses. And they're able to move on with a, in a productive way through the counseling session. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I thought that was a, a great um, example of what you say uh, 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 elsewhere, that every interaction is in fact a multicultural interaction. So maybe you could say more about that. So um, uh, a lot of my students think that they only need to broach if they're broaching with somebody who's of a different racial, ethnic, cultural group. And my thing is it doesn't matter who you are, I think you need to broach because as you say, every interaction is a multicultural interaction. And so, um, I, most of my students historically have been white. And so I have them broach with each other. You know, it doesn't matter that you are both white. You may be from different regions of the country. You may be from different social class backgrounds. You may have different religious orientations. You may have different sexual orientations. So you, you want, you, and you don't want to shut that down because if the counselor, if the client thinks that um, you're presuming sameness, they may feel like they can't talk about an aspect of their identity that may be hidden. What Janet Helms talks about, uh, well, well, see, that may be hidden. And so we need to speak on that. Every sort of identity dimension isn't visible. What Janet Helms refers to as a visible racial ethnic group um, sort of uh, way of presenting. So it becomes important to broach because you never know what differences, um, what shared dimensions you have, what differences you have. Yes, uh, I, I, that, that's so true regarding uh, visible and invisible identities, um, and uh, uh, you know, and so so I think um, it's uh, you know it, it's so important to uh, uh, to uh, to work through one's own understanding of one's identity, and I think certainly therapy brings us to identity and context very quickly if we allow it to. Um, um, so, uh, is, is there a a quote unquote new culture that broaching and therapy can create. Uh, how would you describe the culture that that broaching is aiming to, so, uh, to yes. create? Um, so because we've had all this trepidation talking about race and in the therapeutic encounter, if the counselor can facilitate a productive conversation around race, ethnicity, and culture and sort of, you know, sort of model this and be receptive to what the client is saying and experiencing and being supportive, it may serve as a context for the client to be able to go out and have productive conversations or address um, these issues outside the counseling environment. Um, so I think there's a, a modeling that can occur that can then have an, a, a, a favorable impact on other kinds of interactions that the client has. I had a, a great discussion in here. There's a possibility that I may be able to have similar kinds of discussions outside of counseling. I think there's also the opportunity um, by having these discussions for the for, well, really both the counselor and the client, but the client to have a, a greater sense of introspective awareness. Who am I? What does this mean? How do I connect the dots? What's the connection between you know, sort of maybe how I was raised or the historical connections between some of the challenges that I've had and what's going on now? So I think there's a, a great opportunity for real understanding and connecting the dots. Yes, and, and uh, I think that culture sometimes assists us um, 
I'm thinking of uh, many cases uh, over the last uh, decade uh, with the Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter, uh, certainly um, the, the, the presidential elections and so forth, where these, uh, these issues have just come up, entered the therapy uh, on their own. Um, and uh, so, so this, this, uh, this is another way uh, we, we can get into it. But um, actually, there's, there's another situation which I'm thinking of uh, recalling many, what I've heard around the community uh, is uh, uh, people uh, saying their, their clients might say things which are, you know, uh, and of course, therapy is a safe space to, to reveal one's inmost thoughts, but may say things that are, uh, that are aggressive or racist, uh, sexist, et cetera, uh, sometimes even in some way directed at the therapist's um, uh, identity, uh, either passively or actively. Um, so uh, do you have any suggestions for navigating that uh, with broaching and, and with, your, with your spectrum and model? So one of the things is just to explore, you know, um, help me understand. So we're not going to attack the client. We're not going to um, be aggressive towards the client. But one of the things we want to do is work towards understanding. Help me understand what you meant by that. Where is that coming from? from, you know, um, I, it sounded like you were kind of talking, of, you know, um, about me. I, I'm wondering who I remind you. Yeah, I wonder, I'm wondering who I remind you of is, you know, what sort of precipitated this kind of conversation and really help the client sort of un understand rather than to ignore it, because I think sometimes they're, they can, it, it, these kinds of conversations can be ignored. Um, but I think we want to help the client uh, we want to help shape behavior and help them uh, have more productive experiences outside the counseling environment, too, because some of the things that may be offensive in the counseling session may often be said outside of the counseling session. But an opportunity to process what is going on, to use immediacy. In the article, we talk about cultural immediacy in terms of talking about the you know, relationship. And then, and then I would also, if I were in a session with a, counsel, with a client after we got through that, I might explore how I felt. I know this was not your intent to um, to hurt my feelings or to say something offensive, but but it is, I do sometimes um, struggle when I hear people use that kind of language about women or about African Americans or about what you know whatever identity group they may be making reference to. But I think it's important. I would also you know we were talking a little while about the organizational development model. I think that organizations can be supportive in this instance too. I know that there are a lot of um, therapists who fell under attack during this time um, uh, by, by clients um, who you know, want to work with a different therapist or a therapist that is not a, uh, from a minoritized background. And many times a therapist is on their own to try to uh, move through this, but it's incumbent upon an organization to say we stand by our uh, we stand by our counselors. We've only hired the best counselors. This person is equipped to work with you, and um, these are the behaviors that we expect. And if you are going to be in receive services in our organization, um, then the, these are the expectations that we have of you. So um, it doesn't so that the counselor doesn't feel like they're on their own sort of navigating this space, you know, shark infested waters without a, a, um, um, a life preserver. Well, thank you so much. And I think that uh, you, you mentioned the word understanding again, and uh, back to Nina Simone, please don't let me be misunderstood. And, and I think um, certainly your work has so profoundly uh, moved uh, uh, the therapeutic possibilities towards a culture of understanding and compassion with the recognition that their opposites are always around and we have to be very uh, aware of them and to bring them into context. So thank you so much for your work and for your commitment. Uh, uh, you're very inspiring. And oh, is there anything else you'd like to say uh, to close out or I didn't? Uh, as we have we covered, just, kind of covered. I, I, okay. I would just say that if you haven't broached with clients before, it feels daunting. Uh, it feels like, what am I going to say? What am I going to do? How's a client going to? But 
it may be helpful just to write. I used to have students just write down things that they would say because what I, the struggle is sometimes not about wanting to do it. The sub struggle is around knowing what to do. So, you know, giving giving yourself the tools and the language where you're practicing in advance to think about what you're going to say and how you're going to say it. Um, uh, some people may call it a cheat yeah. sheet, but you keep cheating until you get it right. Well, yes. Um, I'm actually just thinking of another example, uh, uh, examples that happened several times over the last couple of years of where I felt misunderstood or not, not really seen a, as uh, myself uh, 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 by, by a patient, a, a white patient, a person from the dominant culture, a uh, good relationship. And it actually, you know, it, it actually took, uh, you know, just uh, not knowing what's going to happen, but I'm going to bring this up and uh, uh, talk about this. Um, and it, it's invariably led to a closer relationship. So uh, I think, you know, perhaps in my own way, I was trying to broach, um, but, but I really appreciate the model and, and uh, uh, it deepens, it deepens the, the possibilities. So thank you so much. Thank you.